I remember being waiting outside of the room with a deacon. Um, he was walking me down the aisle and I remember like shaking, holding on to him and being like, if I just run out the back, what will happen? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> If you want to move on past this part, it's okay. No, it's okay. I'm just... Um... I wanted to run out the back door. Um... And he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, like, will they kick me out? He was like, yeah. You'll get kicked out if you just run away right now and ruin this. And I was like, okay. And then I just... Sucked it up and walked in. Well, Corey, thank you so much for being here today with us. Um, and Anthony, welcome back. This is uh, second time co-hosting. Is that right? Yeah, second time. Second time. Okay. So I told him after the last one, I feel like um, it was very helpful uh, having somebody who you know has years of experience in the WMS. It just adds a whole other level of perspective and questions that I would never think to ask. So um, yeah, I appreciate you being here as well, Anthony, as always. Uh, but Corey has, I guess I would say, uh, everybody has a unique experience, of course, as a former member, but uh, that's definitely the case with Corey. And, and she's going to share some different um, stories and experiences she had that are, you know, just as always are going to be very revealing about the nature of the World Mission Society Church of God. Uh, <clears throat> this conversation is going to entail all of us sharing our personal opinions. Uh, Corey is going to be sharing her personal experiences as a former member. Um, and I would just ask that those of you watching, whether you're a current member uh, or a former member, of course, we hope this this is helpful to you as former members. But if you're a current member, that you would just, you know, <laughs> do what you can do. Lay aside the biases, the false narrative that you've probably been given that Corey and anybody else like Anthony, even anybody that's left the church is, you know, following Satan and possessed by the devil, just give her, give her a fair hearing. There's a proverb that talks about how a, a fool speaks before listening. Uh, but the one who is wise will actually listen before making a judgment, making um, a, a, you know, uh, an assumption about a person and their character. So give Corey a chance to share her story. Uh, so Corey has an Instagram page called WMSCOG Spotlight. Is that correct? WMSCOG in the spot. Well, yeah, the the, t the handle is WMSCOG it, Spotlight. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. So the actual title that is in the spotlight, is that yes. the... WMSCOG okay. Spotlight. There's a website too that I'm working on. Um, awesome. So it's kind of like a little platform that I just created recently. Okay. So I would encourage you, if you're on Instagram, go over there and subscribe but she's kind of maybe just give a brief summary of like what's your what's your goal with this what are you trying to do with so, this page so at first i kind of like was doing it for my own kind of therapeutic writing to put my own story out there because i found that it was really helpful for me to process it in that way like with writing i felt like when i could write it and talk about it then i could internalize it and process it, but I realized a lot of other people were also benefiting. Um, and I wanted to create a platform that had like a really transparent look. Like I didn't want, I'm not hiding. I don't want to, I'm not creating any kind of false rumors. I'm just here to share my, my experience and give other people a platform to do the same thing. Um, so I even have a lot of content ideas, like people who might be inspired to share little things on their own, but maybe they don't want to put their face or their name or their voice out there yet. Like I'll, I want to do, I'll do it for you. Like I'll, I'm making content to be able to have other people, you know, have a resource to look at. That's sometimes I go like when I first went online and went around, yours was one of the first channels that I, actually my first video ever, um, not given by the church was on, um, answering the WMSCOG. And uh, I really liked it because it. Some people are a little bit. They have different agendas, and 
<laughs> it can get a little weird. And <laughs> so I wanted it to be like a really, a really trusted source that this is coming from somebody who's a former member and to make it feel like a safer space, not just scary, like <laughs> because yeah. there's so much stigma around online. So yes, for said. sure. Yeah. Well, that's mm -hmm. great. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've read through a couple of the posts and they're very well written and, and insightful and Corey will get into some of her experiences, but there's some things that I know she's not alone in, in just the terrible ways that she was treated at different times. I know that there's, you know, the terrible thing is that there's so many other people out there right now experiencing that or, or worse or at different levels. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, I appreciate another voice out there on Instagram uh, speaking out, sharing your story. So I thought you, your last post was sort of a um, an introduction of yourself, just to kind of give people a snapshot of mm -hmm. who you are, what your experiences in the group was. And so I thought it'd be kind of fun if you just read that little paragraph to kind of introduce who you are, what your experience was in the WMS. And then I'm going to kind of hand it over to Anthony to open it up with with the first uh, couple questions about your story. Okay, great. All right, so it's the first post that's uh, uh, pinned to the top of my page, um, and it's the second paragraph is My name is Corey. I was baptized into the church in Maryland back in 2010, and I attended that location until 2015. In November of 2015, I moved to New Windsor, New York, and spent the rest of my time there, minus a brief attendance at the church in Belleville, New Jersey, during my last few months in. I did not hold an official title in the church, but very much carried out roles and functions as someone who did. I was involved in high-level projects or missions, working closely with the head pastor of the U.S., Daniel Lee. I was on the tech team, which is what we call the multimedia department that's in charge of media production, including website writing, social media, videography, photography, graphics, etc. I was involved in performing arts and large scale events, um, planning them and was employed at the We Love You Foundation, which is one of the cult's main nonprofit front groups. I have been to Korea twice and I've met Jang Gil Ja, or as the church calls her, God the Mother as well as Kim Ju Chol, who is the general pastor. I experienced an arranged marriage, public rebuking, public body shaming, verbal and psychological abuse and shunning. I have witnessed child abuse, open homophobia, ableism and racism by leadership. I decided to create this platform to speak out about what happened to me and to offer others a safe space to do the same. And I intend to share as much as I can to offer more insight into this group. I will not be holding back not the good not the bad and not the ugly if you have any mm. questions feedback or ideas please feel free to message me or comment below <laughs> there you go so go give her instagram a, a follow and i i liked how you added in you're not holding back and it's not only the the bad and the ugly you're not going to hold back but not the the good either the, yeah. the good experiences and, and i hope that's what helps people to see that you're not you honestly just want to <clears throat> let people know what it was that you experienced and mm -hmm. then they can do with that information what they want. Um, exactly. But uh, yeah. So Anthony, All take right. it away, my man. Well, Corey, I, again, I appreciate uh, being able to talk to you, hear your story. I know that we've, uh, we've chatted before a little bit, um, but I think this is a great opportunity for your story because you know, it's like Jordan was saying before, everyone has a unique story, but also in a lot of ways, everybody has the same story. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where were you just before being introduced to the church? What was life looking like? Okay, uh, we're going way back. <laughs> we're, going, we're going way back from the start. Way back. Early no, way 2010. Back. Yeah. Long, long time ago in a galaxy far away. I'm kidding. Well, what, okay. what kind of phone did you have at the time? Was the iPhone out? Did you? <laughs> no, I did not have an iPhone, actually. It was the, so 13 years ago. Um, yeah. Actually, a little the, bit the, longer. Just <laughs> yeah. to, to give context of what the world looked like yeah, all the way yeah, back exactly. then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I was actually 19 when I first was introduced to the church. Um, I was living in Baltimore, Maryland, and... Um, I was going to a barbering school, which is like hair school, and uh, life, 
I was going through a really, really rough time. Um, there had been a couple things that had happened to me leading up to this point that caused me to be in a really dark place kind of mentally. I was struggling with my mental health. I had growing up, my dream was to be a police officer and then go to law school eventually. Like I had all these ambitions and dreams and something happened that made me kind of veer off of that. So I was like unsure and uh, a little bit lost in like a sense of what I wanted to do in life. And I was just really young, hadn't still living at home. Uh, I randomly went to this hair school. I didn't even like doing it. <laughs> Like, I'm not really like, a, I don't like touching people that close. So it was <laughs> a random thing that I did because I just wanted to, I have felt like I was like, I got to do something. Like, I can't just shut myself away in a miserable hole. Like, I was just really, I was, I would, um, I'm getting a little candid here, but I was flirting back and forth with some, sorry, with a little bit of like suicidal thoughts. Um, so it was a really dark place. Um, and, uh, it was kind of, it ended up being kind of a perfect storm for me <laughs> to mm. enter the church because um, one of my branch, or for those who are just watching, that's the term that people use in the church. Like if somebody invites you, that person that invited you is your branch, and then you are their fruit after you're baptized. So my branch was a deaconess in the church, still is. She's a church leader now. I think Virginia Beach, that doesn't matter. I'm veering off. <laughs> yeah. But um, she was a teacher there and she was always really, really happy to the point of, I can, I'll say this because I used to say this to her directly. I was like, you were just annoying about it. <laughs> like yeah. so happy. And um, it came across as a little bit ingenuine. And I used to kind of even say that to some friends there, like, like everybody knew her as she was this church person and she always invited people and I knew about her and uh, she eventually invited me. I stood her up a couple times because I, I was very clear from the beginning, like I'm not really interested in going to church. I do not want to join the church. Like I just like what you're telling me. I just like to hear what you're saying. I didn't really have a foundation in Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, so, but she made the Bible sound like this box of secrets, like, <laughs> like, that only some people can know the answer. Like there's these secrets and prophecy in the last days. And it was intriguing to me. She was really good at making it sound really, really enticing to listen to. I see and, like sci-fi based on your background. So I could see yeah. the appeal for this. <laughs> yeah. I love, I, lo I also really love stories and storytelling. And I was always fascinated by the Bible in general. Like, I didn't understand how people could base their faith off of a book that was written by so many different people. And so eventually I went after um, much prodding. It was probably like three or four months before I actually went. And it was June of 2010. And I went, didn't know it was a house church. She was a little bit unclear about what I was getting involved in. <laughs> All right, deception began the introduction, go on. Yeah, it was pretty, I look back at it now and I'm like, yo, that was shady. Like you didn't tell me, I, you said we were going to a church and then we were dr driving there in my car and she's like, slow down, it's up here on the left. I'm like, where, that's a house. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, yeah, 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 that's how we, and I was like, okay. We get there, there's like no furniture, there's nothing in there, just like a blank house. And it was, I was like, does somebody live here? Like, it was just so weird. The whole the whole thing was very strange. There was no furniture. There was all these pictures on the walls of this Korean woman. And um, which was also weird because I expected it to be like furnished and like, like uh, lived in, you know? Yeah, or having pictures of their family who lives there. Yeah. Yeah, but it was not. <laughs> So I remember even asking her, like, who is that? Like, what is, what's, what's with the lady? And she was like, oh, that's uh, one of the leaders of the church. And I was like, okay, you know. Again, like, deception, go on. Yep, yep. Did not mention that she was God the mother, that that's who she believed as, like, God incarnate. Um, but, you know, there we go. Uh, <laughs> we get in there. I, um, it was just her and one Korean girl, really young, came out. She barely spoke a few words in English and I later on learned that she'd only been in the country for like 20 days or something um, and they put her to study with me which was looking back I'm like why didn't why didn't my branch just study with me she was American but um 
I listened to her and she was teaching me about the Sabbath. All I knew was that they obviously worship on Saturdays. And, but right off the bat, that really did intrigue me because they come at you with something that seems so factual, you know, mm -hmm. you can't refute the fact that Saturday is the seventh day. Now you can get into ba to debates about whether or not you should keep it as a Christian and all that other stuff, but you can't say that seven does not add up to Saturday. So you're automatically like, right. Oh, that's really cool. Nobody knows this fact. I never looked at a calendar, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> like so it, it, uh, it, I was baptized that night, basically. Um, also, it was a it was a third day service, um, which I didn't know was it was a service day. So that was another thing that she didn't really <laughs> disclose to me. It was kind of just like keeping me there as long as possible. But next was, thing you know, you have a veil on your head, and <laughs> yep. Next thing I know, there's a veil. Then I saw An Sang Hong in the book, and I was like, "What's that?" Like I noticed these things right away. And I'm like, what is who? What is that? What does that word mean? And she was just like, oh, that's just a word for Jesus. And I was like, okay. Like, I just assumed that it just meant Jesus in Korean. Like, I don't, why would she lie about it? Yeah, they told me it meant Holy Spirit in Korean. Oh, okay. I just was told that yeah. that was like the word for Jesus in Korean. And I was like, all right. So I did not know. I had no idea. They didn't ask me if I wanted to be baptized in his name. They didn't ask me if... I was okay with it. They didn't tell me that they believed in him as God. I had no idea until I studied about it. It was back in those times. Nowadays, they're a little bit more upfront. I think because of all of the uh, negative feedback that they're getting, <laughs> which means it's working. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, like, that, at least yeah. that's one thing that that's why I want to do this because they are a very reactive cult. They, mm -hmm. Whether or not they want to, they'll watch this now and be like, no, we don't care what you say. You you do because you start changing things little by little because people say <laughs> stuff. Like if yeah. you don't want to be called a cult, don't do culty things. <laughs> like yeah. Let people have an informed decision before they decide to like give their lives to this. But I did not know that nope. he was God until I studied how, when, and where. It was back in the that day. Yeah, was no, no, me, me as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that they have altered things since then. Yeah. I did want to circle back to the beginning of your story a little bit because what you were saying, where you were in your headspace, you know, you were like the perfect target for a cult group to come after. Like mm -hmm. you were primed and ready for them to indoctrinate you and mm -hmm. absorb you into like this community where they provide what seems to be all the answers and all the mm -hmm. comfort and all the love that you can look for. So at that time, you know, looking and hearing your story, it was, you were the perfect target for them to come and pick up and bring into the church. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it just sounds like they were not being upfront with their teachings to you. No. They were, they were allowing you to see just the benign outside layer of their teachings and then introduce you slowly layer by layer into it. So that's also a very big, method of cult groups not to show you their inner teachings but to give you little by little so it sounds like in your indoctrination process they're being very methodical about the information that they could give you mm -hmm. like would she come to a house well let's not tell her it's a house mm -hmm. you know will she believe in the name on sung home well let's not tell her that mm -hmm. you know let's just say it means mm -hmm. jesus who's this lady oh she's just a leader mm -hmm. you know all these things are very deceptive mm -hmm. bringing you in Mm -hmm. So once you started to study, you were intrigued, like, the, you know, finally you're there, you're studying. What's the next step? Do they baptize you the first day? Yes. They're, um, I'm no, I know you guys have talked about it before, but that study, be baptized immediately. They push that a lot. Um, you might get hit by a bus when you leave. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't know what's going to happen when you leave. What if you say no and then you die? And uh, I was, and another thing um, that, kind of will add to that topic about my headspace and everything as from my very young age I had a very unhealthy fear of death and dying and I was afraid of it and like to the point where like birthdays were just not fun for me because it just meant another year closer to death like I was I was a very morbid child <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd be like mom don't get older like the thought of my mom like I just 
it, it, it was a fear of mine, like a very real f- phobia almost. And then my first day there, my first service after I studied Sabbath that night, the service was forgiveness of sins. And of course, there's this guy standing there telling me that there's a, there's a, you know, this solution to death, like you don't have to die and eternal life and showing me these verses. And it was just, I was in, I was amazed. I, that to me, what, what drew me into the church and kept me there was the teachings because I had no foundation in Christianity. I did not know. I thought that they, why would I go to a church and expect them to be intentionally trying to manipulate me? Like, why would I, why would I no. stop, you know? Yeah. You you don't, you don't think yeah. of those things. No. <laughs> That's think kind of, of like, well, I'll go under it. Well, I was just going to say, I think it was maybe in one of your posts that kind of the way you, the language you use and the way you worded it, which, which I know others have as well, but how they, they took like this sincere, genuine desire for God and the Bible that you were searching for and they weaponized it against you, which mm-hmm. I think is such a uh, pointed language to use to kind of really get at the heart of what, what is happening here, mm-hmm. uh, that this is, it's just this is abusive sort of uh, uh, you know relating to how they they take advantage of people and mm-hmm. um, so yeah I think that's that's exactly what it is they took mm-hmm. and they do they're again they're doing that for so many other people this is and that that's one of the things that continues as I probably say in every video I'm probably a <laughs> a, a, a bit repetitive with this but that just Every time that gets me, I read that. I remember reading that phrase the other day. And when I read that, it just oh, it just makes me angry inside because that's what they're doing to people. People mm-hmm. that want that's just, what it feels- oh, the Bible. There's something meaningful here. I want to find meaning in my life. Mm-hmm. I want to find something, you know, I want to relate to God. I want to, I want to find mm-hmm. peace in prayer. Mm-hmm. And, and they're like, oh, look at that. Look at that mm-hmm. person. And rather than going in and like getting underneath that person, serving them, helping them, a uh, uh, sa- self-sacrificial love of, of of genuinely wanting the better for that person, they see that person as an opportunity to to you know get something for themselves, in make money case. ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so. You you get baptized mm-hmm. at the church, and then how long is it into your process that you feel from I'm learning about this to I can't live without this? Ooh, pretty early on, um, because they really I I see the WMSCOG as like a very well oiled machine, very well oiled. They know it's like they have a plan for every step of your process until you get too old like older in faith and then you're no longer like producing then they just kind of cast you off to the side they haven't figured that part out yet that's my opinion mm. but <laughs> but from the new from when you first join until you become what they want like a gospel worker they have it covered so like even when i first started and i was so excited like i was i really loved the bible i was really into this the teachings and they prep you like they say like you know when you go and tell your family they're going to persecute you they're going to disagree they're going to speak back but that's a sign that you're following christ the right way because jesus was didn't get welcomed jesus was persecuted look at him he was crucified even the disciples after him peter was crucified upside down like they you know so when you go to your family you have to know that this is happening for a reason. So it, they call it like a spiritual vaccine back in the day, you know, like where you mm-hmm. vac- you vaccinate the, the new fruit to let them know that they're going to get persecuted, but that's a blessing. So you have like this, you get this weird, like pumped up feeling like, oh, I'm going to go home and I tell my mom and she's not going to like it, but I'm ready, you know, <laughs> like, yes. like kind of weird backwards way of thinking. Like actually just because someone disagrees with you doesn't necessarily mean you're right. They like take it and flip it like but they prepare you mentally yeah like look at all these other prophecies we've told you about this is a prophecy too and Mm -hmm. you will be persecuted and anyone who has an opinion that goes against us is a slanderer and they're attacking Mm -hmm. you and your faith and your salvation and they're working for satan because it's under the control of Satan. yeah 
everyone is to the WMSCOG. If you are not in it, you are a demon. Like everybody is a demon possessed. And as somebody who like has had a legitimate phobia of fear of death and demons, even like spiritual world stuff, because that really freaked me out as a kid. That was a fear was a really big part of it. Fear drove me to be like, oh my God, I have to be here. Also, you know, just I really had a really strong faith in everything that they taught me because I did not think for one second that a deacon, he was a deacon at the time, now he's a pastor, it's John Casas. I did not think that there would be any reason for him to not tell me the truth. You know, like you're a mm -hmm. deacon in a church, like I'm gonna believe you, I trust you. Um, so it was pretty early on that I, I got really sucked into it pretty fast. I would say within like a couple, like a month maybe. So yeah, within within a month already, mm -hmm. you're you're living your life for this, thinking that you found mm -hmm. the answer to everything. Yeah, and, and, go on. Sorry, and back then in 2010, it was like really extra that father was coming. Like, <laughs> I was about to ask you about the um, the 2012 mm -hmm. predictions, and yes, at what point did you start to hear that? Welcome. You came at the perfect time because it, everything's about to end. Like, immediately. Yeah. <laughs> it was like immediately. Like when I studied the seal of God, I had a whole panic attack because I was like, <laughs> oh my God, this is happening like in my lifetime. And they're like, he could come tomorrow. He could come tonight. Like it was like that. And, uh, and this was 2010. And then, you know, they talked about 2012 a lot. There was this time in 2010 where John Gilja, like, I think it was 2010 or 2011 where she was like, father's coming, prepare. And we all literally in the basement of the house church, we had had these big like utility shelves and we started stocking it with water and like MREs. Is that what they're called? Like the, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes. The, like the military rations. Yeah. Every Friday I would come with my trunk filled with those one gallon waters, like as many as I could afford and fit in there and like bring them to the church. And I actually watched a video where you said later on in Maryland, you found this like secret stockpile. And I'm like, that was probably my water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I remember they had, they had a whole floor of the, the, the temple in Glen Burnie. Yeah. And it was, it would had a whole bunch of like, giant bottles of water and food and like they were doing construction. They threw all that stuff right into the garbage. And it was there from, I guess your days over there. Probably. Cause I was serious. I was like, God is coming. Like we're going to be. And I remember even one time we, they had a, like, there was a weird thing going around where everybody wore these lanyards in, this was Maryland anyway, the house church. Okay. I don't know about anybody else, but everybody had these lanyards because back in the day, your phone could like, you know how you have those little, Julie things right. they would carry that. their yeah they would carry their phones on their lanyard so that they wouldn't miss the call because it was like this whole thing of like if you miss the call we're only gonna call once you have to flee to Zion and people were freaking out panicking and I was one of them I bought a lanyard so did my branch she was the one that told me about it it was just so when they, so later on when they were like we never said 2012 I remember in my brain I was like like you have this this moment where you're like, wait, a, yes, yes, you did, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you really did, and you did for a long ass time. Oh, sorry, oh, no, <laughs> you're good. Yeah. You, did, you did for a yeah. long time. <laughs> That's like exactly like my first experience with gaslighting too. I was like, this yeah. is well, I'm sure it's not the first, but probably like yes. the biggest, <laughs> the biggest where I was where I finally noticed it because I was like, yeah, all right, anyway, we'll just. You just yeah, kinda... I mean, and then do you remember the the year of inspection after that, where it was um, okay? Now that the building's complete, now that the spiritual temple's complete, now we got to make sure it's up to code. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then and, the year and, of jubilee. And here it is a decade later, and they're still like, uh, <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. It, I mean, that was completely <laughs> ridiculous, and it, it's just like I kept on feeling like if I just was patient they would give me the answer. Like I they'd explain too. it at some point, what happened, mm -hmm. but nothing happened. No, no, there's no explanation. Nothing. I mean, did you hear anything at all? No, no, nothing. They just, they, they, they're really, well, they are really good at gaslighting, I guess, um, because they, 
do it to the point where you're like, maybe they didn't say that. Like you really start second guessing for a little bit. Like maybe they, maybe I misunderstood or maybe because the other thing, the other psychology that they use is like, everything is your fault. You are the sinner. You are wrong. You are, you know, like, so even if I wanted to stop and question, like, wait a minute, you did say 2010 or 20, 2012, they'd be like, who are you? Like, you know, the, the, like, how are you to talk back to God? You know, why are you questioning? Like you're a sinner. So you start internalizing that too. Like maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I misinterpreted what they were saying. Maybe it was me. You start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or you should be thankful that God gave you extra time. If <laughs> he came in 2012, would you have been ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. They, they know exactly what to say. So yeah. it's just, it's, it's all of these barriers that they set up around your family, mm -hmm. uh, around all these different areas to basically block you as like these, these, uh, you know, gateways that keep you from moving into critical thinking. Like as, mm -hmm. if you're going to be pushed, they know you're going to be pushed and prodded into thinking and questioning. But if they set up strategically all these things in place uh, beforehand preemptively, then when those things come, you yourself are going to be your own, you know, gatekeeper, really. They make you your own gatekeeper. They make your fears and your, your own, uh, uh, you know, lack of self-worth. You know, you're talking about they make you think that you're just this terrible sinner. And so you even question your own sanity and your own ability to, to comprehend the facts in front of you. And so mm -hmm. it just all these things set up to keep you from thinking critically from, from, you know, and, and to just continue to, uh, in that cycle of sweeping things, uh, underneath the rug rather than really diving into them and, and searching them out. Right. Exactly. So I, I did want to bring up Corey, this next part. Um, I know that in the church, a lot of people have the accusation of an arranged marriage. Um, I know that you have some, uh, story, to tell about uh, your marriage that you had experienced while in this church. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could kind of go over the details of what happened, how were you introduced to your husband? What was the story behind that? And then also um, when the church tried to fight the accusations of uh, arranged marriages, your experience with that as well, if you could go over those. Um... Sure. Um... This is a memory I try to block out, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> it's okay. Rip it um, open. Come on. <laughs> yeah, rip it open. Like a band aid. So I was in an arranged marriage. Um, it. I was married to a member in 2013. We remained married for about four years. Um, he went to the church in Maryland, but we did not ever really speak to each other. Um, I mean, I knew who he was because he went to the church there, but I never spoke to him, like had a conversation. Um, he was not, <laughs> I wasn't somebody that I would have ever, um, ever spoken to in any sense. <laughs> um, and people who know me and people who know who it is, they will agree with the same thing because it just was not, I would never have ever agreed to something like that. Um, but we were introduced, it was by John Casas, who's a pastor in the church now. Um, he, it was, I look back at it now and it was a very, it's now it's obvious to me because I was in this time of my life where I was so broke. Like I was, I was working three jobs. I was struggling financially. I was barely staying afloat. I had lost my car. I had, purchased a scooter <laughs> um did trying the church have anything to do with with that or was this just oh, yeah. kind of like where your life was based on skill sets no 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 it was it was absolutely like the demands of the church like i mean i'm not gonna say that they didn't let me get a job but it was because of the all the time yeah yeah the restrictions everything um and the fact that i just you give up everything and I was so young when I first joined that I didn't even have a sense of like how to be an adult. <laughs> the lanyards. <laughs> yeah. And you're, you know, you know, you're taught like father's coming. There's no sense. And, you know, we even had 
we even had like services about um, not having a safety net. Like that was a sin, you know, like, <laughs> like yeah. if you, if you uh, save your money or, you know, don't give it to the church or, you know, everything should be everything given to the church. So I gave everything I had and it wasn't much. I didn't have much to begin with. I was a kid, but um, so I was struggling and, I, my, the little car that I had broke down after I, well, the first car I wrecked because I fell asleep driving, leaving the church one night on a Saturday (laughs) and it was uh, completely totaled. Then I got another car that I bought with the insurance money. That thing broke down. Then I got a scooter with the little bit of money that I had left. So I was driving this scooter around to make sure that I could figure out how to keep the Sabbath. And then that got stolen out of the church parking lot because it's in a bad part of of Maryland. (laughs) So I was like walking and on this bike and all this stuff. And I was praying to God, like, please let me have a way out and writing letters to mother about like, you know, help me. I don't want to die spiritually by, you know, because they also teach that everything in your physical life is a, is a shadow of your spiritual life. So I felt like there was something wrong with me because I was struggling. And um, anyway, this, this is relevant. I promise. Because when I um, oh yeah totally no I, I'm I'm just I'm getting like frustrated like not with you oh. uh, obviously but with the story because I know that it was stolen because they wouldn't let you bring it inside you couldn't like right. keep your scooter inside you had to keep it outside because they're so precious you know the, you know precious you can't bring that in here and then right. um, the fact that they're the ones who caused all this chaos in your life and when your mm-hmm. life crumbles mm-hmm. then they make you feel guilty about it. Like yeah. it's your fault because of something you did in the spiritual world. So yeah. it's like this it's insult to injury. Like, right. Yeah. So right. you need to give more to the church because, you know, your life's so bad. You have to forget more about the physical life and then your physical life's going to crumble more. And it's just like this vicious cycle. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry. Like, you know, it just, I, I could see what kind of bad situation you were in and I'm just empathizing, <laughs> but uh, please go on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was uh, actually at a point where I, I ended up coming to my roommate, one of them. I lived with seven at the time in a two-bedroom apartment. Um, and But I still couldn't pay my little portion of rent. Like, I knew I wasn't going to have enough because it was like I didn't have enough for food. I didn't I didn't even have a cell phone at the time. I had, I like, like everything I had lost because I was so broke. So I told her, like, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay the full amount of rent. So she went and told John Casas and then he had this whole dorm room meeting where he called all the sisters that I lived with into a conference room and rebuked me about like how my physical life is a mess and it's causing everybody else problems and my spiritual life is a mess. And then he took everything away from me. I wasn't allowed to teach. I wasn't allowed to be in choir anymore. I was like removed from all the little blessings that I had in Maryland at the time. And then he said, nobody help her. Don't give her rides home. Don't give her rides to the church. She's on her own, you know, like that. And, um, and that was devastating. I was petrified because I was like, oh my God, I can't even, you know, so I had to figure out how to get to the church. So I was, I had a bicycle. I rode a bicycle. I walked one day for like two hours because I wasn't close. Um, And then I got the scooter because nobody would give me rides. They weren't allowed to. So people would see me walking on the street and not pick me up because they were told not to, um, which was really hard. <laughs> so Love overflows in Zion. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sacrifice is needed to be a greater vessel is what I was trying to tell myself in my brain. <laughs> but um, anyway, I had these three jobs at this mall. Um, I was working from like, open to close at uh, Arundel Mills Mall, that big outlet mall you know well of. Um, And then one day on a third day, I guess I had been proving myself, whatever. And John Casas brought me into the office and was like, we think it's time for you to get married. And I was like, what? Like I had no, I was not thinking about that at all. I was trying to stay alive. And uh, the brother that he presented me with was I didn't get options um females don't usually get very many options in the church (laughs) it's more like the males get options like you can pick um depending on your situation anyway um and he was like he has a lot of money um you'll be financially stable and you guys can get a lot of blessings because you know you're both white 
you're both like, he knows the studies, you know the studies, you take care of the sisters, you guys can go start a house church because he's really financially stable. And by going with him, you can be financially stable and now you can focus on the gospel work more and this is a great blessing and blah, 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 blah. And um, inside I was like, sure, yes. <laughs> Because well, what did they tell you about marriage? Like, what, did they tell you any, that there's a benefit to it? Just blessings. Or, or just like, blessings. Yeah, like, ble like you'll get, you'll be blessed. You can start a house church, um, and then also, like, I would be financially stable. Like, he knew my situation. He knew it wasn't a secret that I was absolutely struggling. Um, and you're presenting me with this one member that everybody knew made the most money in the church. It wasn't a secret. They just kind of joke about it because. Um, he was the one that had like the highest paychecks at the time, which I look at it now. I'm like, it really wasn't that much <laughs> but because we all were like so poor. Like it, it was a lot. like it. Yeah, it, it was a lot. Like it. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was fine. He was well off, you know, and, um, and I saw it as a way out too. Like I saw it as obviously, yes, it's a blessing in my mind at the time. Mm -hmm. And then it was a way out of this, like by American standards, it was poverty. I'm not, I'm not even being dramatic. Like, <laughs> You, you know, you don't think about that in, in America, like in the US, like poverty, really? No, really, like by American standards, I had nothing. I had nothing. I couldn't pay rent. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have a car. I was walking. I could barely afford food. I was only eating in the church. Like it was just, so here I am, you know, presented with this. And I just said, yes, sure. And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, y yeah, you know, what, what you also, I was in that mindset where you don't say no to God. Like, of yes. course, John was not God, but he's a prophet. Father and mother put him there. Father and mother guide the church. Father and mother pr control everything. So if I say no, I'm saying no to a blessing. I'm saying no to God's will. I'm saying no to this gift, you know, because they teach you also like, Marriage is like a gift of God. You know, you get a suitable helper, you know, this and that. But inside I was like, I I do not want to marry this guy. Like, I don't even like him. I don't even think he's, I don't even think he's cute. Like, <laughs> being real. Like, um, I remember even they, they wanted to have this little like wedding thing. And I did not, I was not interested in that. I did not want to wear a dress. I did not want to have a thing but john casas had insisted on it he's like you're gonna wish you had pictures later blah 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 i know it was just a show now but because i've never even seen those pictures <laughs> never even got the pictures like so they just pictures they wanted to send to korea or something the show or a... i still don't know why i think i don't know i don't know why i don't know but he insisted on it and made us do this little ceremony and we had it in one of the rooms um, in the hallway and I had to wear this stupid dress and all the, it was only the group leaders that were allowed because that's another thing. The weddings are so secretive. Like, you know, you don't really know that they're happening. You just show up one day and they're like, Hey, somebody's getting married. Come in here and be a witness or, Hey, someone's getting married. Here's a wedding. Just sit down and pray, you know, like, and you're like, yeah. all right. So it was like kind of that. And, um, I remember being waiting outside of the room with a deacon. Um, he was walking me down the aisle and I remember like, shaking holding on to him and being like if i just run out the back what will happen <laughs> sorry rehashing the the memory is i'm, I'm, I'm yeah sorry. If, if you want if you want to move on past this part it's okay no it's okay i'm just um I wanted to run out the back door. Mm -hmm. um, and he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, like, will they kick me out? He was like, yeah, you'll get kicked out if you just run away right now and ruin this. And I was like, okay. And then I just sucked it up and walked in. But I, I remember I couldn't even close my eyes for the prayer. I don't know what the heck he said. I don't know what was happening. I was just standing there with the flowers, like shaking because I did not want to do it was it was awful um i didn't want to do a beautiful it. wedding <laughs> <laughs> yeah so beautiful <laughs> no it's so it, I, I know it's 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 definitely like being 
forced into it. I'm so sorry that you had that, that situation. Yeah. yeah. Can't imagine. So, so mm-hmm. what, I guess like your family, um, I don't know, like what was their perspective on this? Um, they didn't really know. I, I kind of randomly threw it on my mom at one point. Um, I really cut my parents off my whole family off pretty early on. And um, so I would rarely give them very much information about my life at all. Like maybe my address sometimes. Um, And I randomly sprung it on one of my parents. I actually have, that's another side thing I want to get into, but my family dynamic is a little different. It's not really accepted by the church because I was raised by two women. And um, I sprung this marriage thing on to one of my parents And uh, she was like, what? You're getting married? And I was like, yep. Like, just super. (laughs) Um, But to this day, like, now we speak and now we have a relationship. She's like, I didn't think it was real. Like, I thought you were just, I thought it was just, like, for show so that you guys could start a church or something. I didn't know it was, like, on page. Like, you guys were really, she's like, I didn't know what to think. I had no idea if you were just, she's like, I didn't want to say anything to upset you. But she didn't. I didn't tell her anything about it. She, I think she met him one time. Um, and she didn't come to, she, I didn't tell her that there was a wedding. It was very, very estranged. We were very estranged for a very long time. Um, so she just kind of, so him. that early, you said you cut him off kind of early. Was that a result of them kind of giving some initial pushback in the beginning mm-hmm. stages? So you just kind of, Yes. Kind of yeah. Okay. And at one point it got so bad that um, I didn't speak to my parents for six years. Like, okay. at all. Nothing. Not No text, no call. Just silence. Okay. Yeah. So and it was yeah. really honest. No, they definitely have a way to one separate you from family in general, but I'm sure once learning about the dynamic of your home life, Mm -hmm. uh, they were less accepting. Um, I, I, I do know that you, um, you did also mention at one point about trying to have your mom come to, uh, to the church Mm -hmm. and to keep a, a Passover or something like that. Um, what was their reaction when you were trying to, because everybody like their dream is to bring their family into the church. I know like for me, every single opportunity I could try to bring a family member to the church, uh, a sibling, um, my mom or, you know, a cousin, I tried everything to get everyone like I was related to, to come because you feel like if you don't, you know, you're, you're leaving them to be condemned to hell. Mm -hmm. in your heart, if you love this person, the best thing you can do is bring them into this, ultimately a cult, but to bring them into this group. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm sure, you know, your love for your, your moms, like you wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. But what was your experience with uh, that concept? So early on, when I brought my, one of my parents, one of my moms, um, she actually got baptized um early early on and i think that they allowed that because they wanted to like encourage me Mm -hmm. or like keep me in a little bit more um and she kept i think like one passover after that and then later on when i moved to new windsor i passover was coming up and i wanted her to come i wanted both my parents to come the other one is was very resistant from the beginning so i never really got very far with her mm-hmm. <laughs> she's gonna watch this later and be like mm-hmm, it's a cult <laughs> <laughs> but, but um my, um i wanted to invite her and i also i missed my parents a lot um and so i went but there was an announcement that year about like anyone it was like extra strict or something because you know they give different different Um, rules each year year is different rules so you have to like pray for a merciful year i guess (laughs) and um that year it was like anybody who's sexually immoral or homosexual or doing drugs or whatever they're not allowed to keep the passover whatever so i went to pastor's office daniel lee 
directly because my mom had already been baptized years before. So she already was like, at least had that criteria that you needed in order to keep it. And I went to him and I was like, am I allowed to invite my mom to keep the Passover? And he was like, why? And I was like, what do you mean? Why? <laughs> like She was baptized. Can, can she keep it? And he was like, no, she's gay. And I was like, okay, uh, well, they're not really like, I tried to like, try to like explain the dynamic. And he was like, no, no, they still live like that. They need to stop. They need to fix their life before they can come to God. And you should just don't waste your time, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, you know, and it, and, and I started to like tear up because it's my family, you know, like I don't like you're hearing this from your pastor and it's, it's really like a, you have to like deny this emotion and this connection that you have to your own parents. It's very difficult to deal with and um, missing them too in the same, same breath of it all. And he was like, that's why you have to do the gospel work hard so that in the end, God can have mercy on them and they won't go to hell. They'll just disappear and die without suffering in hell. If you do, that's why you have to stay. And like, so that was another factor in my mind. Like, if I just stay strong, if I just do this, if I just, if Let I can, more. yeah, if I can make it, then it will save them, you know, like, even though it sucks now, like that type of mentality. But yeah, I was definitely told that I couldn't invite her one year because because of the way she lived her life. And that was really difficult because I'd always been a very accepting person. I don't, I grew up that way. It was normal to me. It was my family. So it was, uh, it was a little rough. That was really rough. Especially, I think um, you were, you were in a leadership role, I, I think kind of early on um, mm -hmm. too, from your time there. I know that you, you know, one, you were living with, in the sister's dorm is what they would call dorm because your home is the church. So yeah. that's just where you sleep. That's why they would call it a dorm. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think everybody had that uh, terminology, but um, we, we did on the East coast for sure. But mm -hmm. um, so being allowed to be in there was one, a good, good sign where they thought you were with your faith, but then they arranged you in a marriage and, um, and then the next step was for you to become a house church leader. Mm -hmm. uh, did that happen directly after marriage? Was it like some time after? What was the uh, the next step for you? Uh, okay, so we, I had left a dorm and moved in with my husband. It's hard to even say that word because it was just. <laughs> um, and we moved in together, and I was just not comfortable. Um, we didn't we didn't go into a house church right away. We were living in his apartment and um, well, sort of, I, it was just, I'm going to get candid here so that people can understand what it's kind of like for everybody. But um, I slept on the floor in the living room because I just could not, it just did not, it was a very uncomfortable situation for me. I did not know this person. I didn't want to be with this person. I was immediately unhappy. I was, I didn't even want to walk down the aisle. So I definitely wasn't happy being living with this guy. Um, so, and we were struggling because neither one of us really liked each other. <laughs> it was very challenging. And then um, overseers changed. John Casas left and George Carrera came. And uh, right when he came, he was like, you're going to go start a house church. And I was like, but we're not really um, in sync here. Like, I don't think that's the best idea for members. And uh, he was like, no, no, you guys will, you guys will do fine. You'll learn how to do it because my husband at the time had funds to be able to go to a little bit more wealthier parts of Maryland because we were in Glen Birdie, B Glen Birdie, oh, yeah. which we call Glen Dirty. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, it's not the best part of town. So they wanted to branch out into like Gaithersburg and Bethesda area, which is a little bit nicer. And we could afford a house out there. So they pushed us into a house church. Um, the first house, house church in Gaithersburg, which was another oh, challenging situation. Um, being in a marriage that's very new, that was arranged, that fighting all the time and then fighting with the other leaders. It's just, a it, it was rough. 
and you have all this pressure of bearing fruit and starting and you know doing all this and you're and you have to take care of the church all by yourself financially there's no help from the main church like we're paying the rent we're paying the electric we're paying the water we're paying the, Most of the food and the whiteboard yeah yeah everything everything it's like you are supporting the church by yourself and um all the offerings that are made get taken back to the temple so you're not even getting <laughs> you know, um so it was a, it was even more stress added on to that relationship and i was miserable that's like i don't even know how to express it in words <laughs> it was it was a well that mission didn't last last forever um no when when did it end your time at a house church like, what um, were the reasons behind that two so 2015 um Early on in 2015, uh, my husband at the time, he was like struggling with his faith. <laughs> Actually, it was great. He got out way before me, <laughs> but um, he was struggling with his faith. He was having a hard time with the money situation because he saw how much of his money was going to the church. And he was a numbers guy, uh, really like meticulous with detail and all that other stuff mm -hmm. just that kind of thinker and um <clears throat> he didn't want to tithe anymore <laughs> he was like i'm giving all this money every week and i there's all this money is going out from the house church and he just was slowly kind of checking out and then the overseers changed again arcesio um, elder ac he came in and like within a couple days he brought me into his office he's like what's the deal with your husband and i was like I don't even what husband like what are you talking about like we're not even <laughs> like I sleep on a I sleep on the floor in the corner of the room like I, we're not even a thing <laughs> and uh he was like really and I'm like yeah like this is not a thing like we're just existing in the same space and he was like we'll divorce him and he's not tithing anyway he doesn't even want to come to church anymore I was like I can do that he was like yeah it's other people get divorced sometimes i'm like yeah well i know that but does that mean it's right and is that okay you know like i didn't ever want to ask or um try to get out of the situation because i felt like you know i'm a sinner i deserve this that type of mentality mm -hmm. <laughs> which is awful when you think about it um and he was like yeah no and pastor wants you up in new windsor anyway because you're a gospel worker and you can do so many things up there and he's like just divorce him and leave and i was like Bounce. So I like within a week because I had been wanting out since day one and I saw it as like this salvation, you know, and I, I, within a week I packed up my car and I drove with whatever could fit in my car and I went up to New Windsor. Elder AC helped me bring a bed up, but that was about it. Yeah. It sounded pretty more pragmatic than anything because mm -hmm. one was a house church being successful with uh, new members. No. Okay, so you're not bringing in new members. Right. You got this guy who's dragging you down, mm -hmm. and you're still like, you know, before you get, you know, brought down by the situation, I think that mm -hmm. they're trying to separate you, salvage the one, yes. and then kind of separate it and, you know, allow you to leave. So I think that it was more like, less like let's make Corey happy and more like let's retain this oh, yeah. one person and separate her from this situation and just deal with this other situation independently. Mm -hmm. It was uh, just a continuation of the business strategy that it was when it started. Yep. When they instigated the marriage in the first place, it was just a business strategy. And, mm -hmm. and now that idea didn't prove to be fruitful. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they, I mean, divorce who cares if, if the if divorce is going to potentially lead to, uh, you know, no. more productivity and getting more money from this person, yep. then who cares? What I what I do wonder is, do you, you you knew him probably closer than most people because of the the nature that one you live with him, you know, I, I it's hard to even call it a marriage, but uh, the situation was you live with him. When he was leaving, when he was departing, I know that you were mentioned that it was about the money that was mm -hmm. the cause. Is that the church's spin on it? Or was that just the result of him checking out for other reasons first? 
Like, um, what what came first? You know, out of those, was it like the money, and then all of a sudden he started to find the fault, or was it he started to find the fault, and now he's worried about the money? No, actually, for him, it really was money. Okay. <laughs> yeah his his issue really was money. Like he was just really. Um, he he was a credit analyst analyst anyway by like his profession. Mm -hmm. So then he's analyzing his own and he's like, I'm putting all this money in, but like for what? I never really knew if he had issues with the doctrine because honestly, we never spoke. Like we did not, yeah, we did not connect okay. on a deeper level at all. Like, <laughs> okay, so it was really just him telling you, like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do this anymore because. I mean, anyone who could sit down with like a pen and paper and do a little bit of basic math can see that there's something fishy happening right? with, with the numbers. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, do yeah, you a, a rent and electric don't cost that much, especially when you're, everyone's giving for food, everyone's paying and covering everything. Mm -hmm. Everyone's, you know, giving extra for the mortgage. Everyone's giving extra for the, it, it does, the numbers don't, don't work out. Right. But, and do anyway, you have um, do you have any idea, uh, general idea of what numbers wise what was coming out of his uh, bank account on a weekly, monthly basis? I mean, do you have a ballpark? Just I mean, even just for people, I think that might be helpful for people to kind of grasp what it what what tithing looks like for for a person. Why so many people like yourself end up in such. Uh, terrible uh, financial situations. So he, his tithe, it, well, so we have to do 10% of gross income. His tithe every two weeks was like 400 something. Um, so that's a lot of money every two weeks. That's like 800 bucks almost, you know, just in the tithing. Yeah. And then you have to do the offerings and then you got to do the rent for the house, which was our portion was like 1900 or something. And um, because it was like twenty four hundred dollar rent, I this is me remembering from like nine oh, years ago. So <laughs> there's a helper couple living with you guys, and it was yeah. split fifty fifty. No, it wasn't it was split six hundred dollars for them, and then like three yeah. times enough for you. Yes, yeah, because we could afford it, you know, quote unquote. Yeah, because they they like to tell you what you can what you can well, afford. Yes, yeah, and then you know we have two cars, and then we have we have you got the food, and then the everything and then we were expected to give like special offerings at the church i remember one time we retiled the whole fellowship room and it came out of my husband's thing because they asked you know like like we, they knew that we had the most money so i think we dropped like we would drop like a couple thousand here and there on random construction needs i know that when we first got married um he had like somewhere close to like fifty thousand dollars in a in a savings account and that was gone by the time before we even divorced like long before so he was just pretty uncomfortable with how much money like his saving like just this was just within a couple years it wasn't and that's the savings on top of his paychecks and all that so i look back now and i can see how stressed out he was and knowing what kind of mindset he is as a human being in general like regardless of our non-compatibility <laughs> um i can understand you know how distressing that was for somebody like that who's very analytical um and it got to him it, if he had other issues i would have honestly i would have no idea because we just did not have we, mm -mm, nope we, well yeah at least after after you know ac came mm -hmm. you guys separated and you went to new windsor to live happily ever after right Ah, no, it got worse. <laughs> ah, you missed it. Oh, on the it floor. can get worse. It can get it can, worse. It can get worse, Jordan. It and it wow. does. I thought I was so excited to go to New Windsor because this is like you know that's like the gospel worker training ground. Yeah, and describe missing. what New Windsor is. Describe this facility. Okay, so New Windsor is like the headquarters of the East Coast. Um, Daniel Lee would like to say of our hemisphere. <laughs> <'Cause> he, <laughs> um, but anyway, it's like the main church. It's, it's on 42 acres. There's three large buildings. It's like a campus kind of. Um, it, it's, 
huge. It's a beautiful property. There's a pond, there's everything. And um, that's the main headquarters in the U.S., basically. Um, Does Daniel Lee, like, preside over New Windsor? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's his main, that's his church. Um, He lives there, too. So, um, like, in the church. Um, So, anyway, it's, like, seen as this gospel worker training ground. Like, everybody saw it as, like, only the elite go to New Windsor. Like you go there and you're trained like military. And then you go out as like these gospel warriors to be sent out into the, in, into the world, like wherever you're going to do like this, the next house church. So you go there so you can learn and study and become this great gospel worker. So I was excited. Like I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to go get missions and blessings and this and that. And um, I went up there and, I got a wake up call. (laughs) It's very, very, very different. Even by um, members standards, people, it's like kind of, it's well known that New Windsor is very intense. Uh, A lot of people don't even want to go there, like, especially like as that their church to attend because they know it's really, really, it's very militant. Um, It's very separate, separated, like the, it's, you get away from that little house church feel like where the members are a little bit more closer and there's a little bit more love and like, (laughs) I don't know about love the word, but (laughs) we're a little bit more close um, Mm -hmm. in the other churches. Whereas New Windsor, it's business. Like it's pretty cutthroat. (laughs) Honestly, that's like the terminology I would use because um, there's a lot of reporting. Uh, It's, it's pretty toxic environment honestly um so to be thrust in there i got a little bit of a culture shock as well and things did just get worse (laughs) well what was the uh the next step i know that um on the topic of arranged marriages the situation that you had faced um and the fact that you just got out of this um situation wasn't there um, a, a story or a situation that you had regarding a survey? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was in New Windsor. Um, so we had had this survey sent around in New Windsor once in the sanctuary. Daniel Lee came down from the altar after service one day, and he started going on about this survey and how people are talking about about the church. So we're going to do this survey and you have to answer it truthfully. If you lie, God will know, like, you know, really drilling in the fear. And then he is like, it's gotta be anonymous. You can't put your name on it and you have to be honest because this is, this is, this is before God. So we passed out this survey and then they had all the group leaders stand at the doors and like block the exits. So you couldn't leave until you filled out the survey and gave it to them. Then you could exit and you can't leave with the survey. So it was like all these questions about like when you joined the church, were you told to quit school um, or did you quit on your own? Were you ever in an arranged marriage? Um, Were you, did you ever get divorced? What's your greatest level of education? Um, Did you ever get an abortion? Did the church ever tell you to get an abortion? Uh, Like all this, all the questions that are, now I look at it and I'm like, is this like, a witness question list <laughs> but it is it felt it like it was like all these questions and he was like be honest be honest so it i don't know why um i did this because there were other questions that i should have answered in a different way but for whatever reason the arranged marriage question i said yes i was in an arranged marriage because i was to me i was arranged i did not know this person John Custis put me with him. And to me, that is an arrangement. I was not. But only by definition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so I, I just, I was like, okay, I got to be honest. Like, I'm not trying to be, I'm not answering this maliciously. I'm just being honest. Like, this is what it is. Oh God, yeah. Yeah. And the other ones I said no to, but I should have said yes in certain instances. But I just, for whatever reason, the marriage thing, I just said yes. And then we had second service and second service was scary. And then right after second service, I found out why. 
So Daniel Lee came down and he started screaming at everybody, like, just like, oh, we have spies in Zion, blah, blah, blah. Like, somebody said that they had an arranged marriage and blah, blah, blah. Who did it? Stand up right now. Who said that? You know, who's a spy? Like, just going in and I started trembling because I was like, oh my God, it's I said that, but I didn't, I'm not a spy. Like, I'm not, I wasn't being malicious. Like, I wasn't trying to like, criticize the church right like yeah. i just i wasn't saying like yeah i was and i hated it like i am now <laughs> yeah but <laughs> God. we yeah we, we have arranged marriages and we eat kimchi like it's just one of the facts of life over yeah, that was, time, honestly but. that was how my i was like innocently answering it like that and he was like he was like you stand up you know like and and i i was i was petrified i couldn't i couldn't so he was pissed because nobody really came forward to ad admit to it but i ran right to his office once he left sobbing and i was like i said to rebecca missionary rebecca she's like the admin late person there and i was like i need to talk to pastor and she was like okay and i ran back and i was like it was me i said it. like i just confessed like sobbing like i said it and he was like what you why and i was like i really like i tried to desperately like explain like I really didn't mean it like that. I just, it was arranged. And then he even asked me, who put you with him? And I was like, John Casas. And he was like, John Casas. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like, I didn't know what that meant, but that was yeah. the, and I was like, I'll change it. I'll change my answer. Give me the, give me the survey again. I'll like, I'll redo it. Like I was scared. Like I thought he was going to kick me out, you know, but it was just a. Didn't they give everybody the survey a second time? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I was there. I I was I was there for that too, and yeah. I also answered uh, yes. <laughs> I was I was going through um, some ups and downs in my marriage too. So oh, okay. like, absolutely. <laughs> and they, one of the questions was about uh, whether or not you're um, you separated from your family. Oh yeah. That too. Uh, if that was the church caused you to sep or have you separated from your family since joining the church? I'm like. Yes, but not because of the church, but, yes, you know, we grew apart. You know, I wrote mm -hmm. like a little note. And That's I remember I Victor um, trying to prep us for the second round of surveys and basically saying, oh, well, you know, one person wrote this. And some people think, oh, they arranged my marriage. Like, yes, we went to the church. So they tried to, like, yeah. re-explain it. it. And, mm -hmm. yeah, I remember I was there for that. And, um <laughs> uh so you were the one who, who yeah <laughs> who went and confessed okay <laughs> yeah sorry about that <laughs> i spy. made it worse for mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah so i mean I, I don't think that that's probably like the worst thing that you've experienced in new windsor mm -hmm. uh, i do know that you actually i did want to backtrack with one thing um mm -hmm. about your time over in uh in maryland one of the things that, you know, a lot of people do want to bring up is the treatment of children mm. uh, in the churches. Um, I know um, that you probably didn't have this mission in New Windsor, but um, I believe that you had stated that you were part of a, a, the kids room in yes. Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could kind of talk about the situations that you've experienced while in the kids room. Um, because it, it is a topic that's very near and dear to a lot of people, um, especially who have kids and, you know, the kind of environment that they're bringing their children into. Um, mm -hmm. If you could give like a little bit of behind the scenes of uh, some of the things that you've witnessed and experienced. Sure. So um, I took care of the kids in Maryland for like a year, maybe, maybe a little less than a year. And they were the older kids. Um, but before I get into that, I want to I'd want to touch base on some things that I witnessed in general, um, especially during like baptisms. Um, the children in the Church of God are, when they're little, it's almost like, this is my opinion. They're, it's almost like they're seen as like less than a member. Like they're just because the their parents are often told that your child can be your idol, you know, like if you don't, if, if if you don't discipline your child, like I've heard in services about like physical discipline, and um, I've witnessed physical discipline done by the church leader's wife to little children. What does that mean, physical discipline? 
like hitting, hitting, pinching. Um, I've seen her put w- one little boy in the closet for like punishment or put hot sauce in his mouth. Like not her children, somebody else's children, even your own children. That's wrong. But, um, and baptisms can be so unnecessarily aggressive and violent even there was one specific one that I remember in the house churches way back in 2010 um this girl brought her young baby she was probably like two or three maybe she didn't speak yet and um she got baptized and then it was time to keep the Passover so for those who don't know the way the ceremony is is you get baptized first and then immediately after you have this other second ceremony of the passover which is bread and wine and then there's like a prayer and then they put all your information in what they call the book of life so anyway this little girl was now in the room for passover and she did not want to keep it she didn't want to eat the bread she didn't want to drink the wine she didn't not she started freaking out and um John Cuss's wife picked up the the bread and like shoved it in her mouth and pushed it down her throat and then held her nose and her mouth closed so that she would be forced to swallow it. And it was, I, I remember being so uncomfortable. This was like when I was newish in the church, you know, like I hadn't been in the church for a year yet, maybe. And I was like, I feel like I'm watching a crime. Like the way that the little girl was freaking out she was obviously did not want to eat this and this woman is literally holding her mouth and nose closed so that she'll swallow it and um it was horrific to watch because she's like screaming and like kicking and the mother is holding her down and viviana's like they're pushing it in her throat and then she stops and lets her like swallow it but the little girl threw it up on the table because she was, yeah, like she was so distressed. The little girl just threw it up on the table and Viviana was pissed. So she picked it up out of the vomit and pushed it back in her mouth and shoved it in her throat, like with her fingers. It was the worst thing I have. And I've seen that a couple times in like baptisms where children do not want to eat the bread and wine and they will eat it. Like, what was the mother's reaction? Was the mother like a, a member who was there for a while or what was the... No, she was kind of... She was new. She And she never... She didn't stay either. She left... Um, like she didn't... Oh, after that. No, I, she didn't remain very long in the church. But um, I was terrified, like just watching it. It was... But the mother was just kind of standing there, you know. She had, she had the girl in her lap and Viviana was just making this happen. And the little girl eventually ate it, but it was it was terrible to watch. And I've witnessed a few like that. Um, and that's just baptism. I've heard some other stories during actual Passover. You know, like the children will eat the bread and wine. Like there is no exception. Like even if they don't eat it, the parent has to eat it. Even if they threw it up, like it's disgusting. But um, that is definitely a practice. I've seen it. Uh, I would classify that as abuse in my own personal opinion. And then the way that the children are disciplined, um, I've seen them be pinched and pushed and slapped. And Viviana once took, I was sitting in the back of the pew, back, back of the sanctuary in Maryland. And this one little boy was just acting up. And she like shoved him down on the ground in the pew underneath her in front of her and put her foot on his head and held his head down on the, on the carpet under the pew and was just like, like telling them to be quiet. And I was sitting next to her and I was like, I was like deaconess. Like she was a deacon. She was like, he's fine. And I was like, like I, to this day, I feel so guilty because I, I like watched it. Like I couldn't, but you don't, what can you, it's hard for me to even verbalize now. Like, um, I feel so guilty. Like, knowing that I watched these things happen and didn't stop it, didn't like intervene. And I I know people will probably, probably judge watching this, but I, I can't express how, what the kind of, the kind of mindset that you're just under, like you just don't go against the leadership. You just see it as law. Like, I don't, 
I don't know how to explain that. Maybe it's hard to stand up. It's hard to to speak out because look what happened for you. Even answering a survey, you got screamed Mm -hmm. at, Yeah, you got made to feel like, Mm -hmm. you know, this big because Mm -hmm. you answered a question on a survey correctly. Imagine if you try to correct a leader, you know, you you go against a deaconess who's, Mm -hmm. you know, put there as you're told by God, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, if you do that, you're speaking against God. And if you speak against yeah. God, what's the situation? You're spiritually right. corrupt. I mean, wasn't there a time where you actually did speak up yes. about a child, about yeah. something with a child? And mm-hmm. what was the result of that? <laughs> and so, re- real quick, this- before before you do that, the, the woman who was holding the child's head down and the one who force fed the bread, was this the same yes. woman? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and she is a church she's leader. Still, yes, is she's she still, still in leadership? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, she's uh, John Costa's wife. They're in Washington, D.C. now. Okay. I'm hoping that they watch this and maybe they'll just think twice about like their behavior. But <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, she's definitely still there. Uh, so, yeah, eventually I was in the kids' room in Maryland, but I took care of the older, we called it the big kids' room. So there was, um, he was like, it was like maybe the youngest was like six or seven and the oldest was I think 14 at the time. And I took that so seriously because I didn't like the way that the kids were treated, you know, when they were little, obviously. So I felt like a sense of like responsibility to be, to make this environment be like, they would be happy to come to church and not scared. And like, we would do fun things and I would come up with these plans. And I loved these kids. Like I'm not a kid person, but I fell in love with these kids. And um, they were scared when they first, when I first got in there, like they wouldn't, some of them wouldn't look me in the eye. Like they were just afraid to ask a question or. Beaten to submission. <laughs> yeah, basically. <clears throat> and I could tell, like, I was like, these kids are traumatized. Like, it felt like that even then. So I started making these games and like these activities and putting on these little puppet show plays and reading books and like all this stuff that nobody else did. And I took it really seriously. And um, anyway, one incident, this was on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And uh it's a that day for those who don't know is a day where everybody has to fast. Um, so it's not a full twenty four hour fast that we usually do, or a seventy two hour because sometimes we do a one day to a three day fast. But on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's just until after the second service. And um, it's for those who also don't know in WMSCOG, fasting is fasting, like no food, no water. I know there are some religions that you know, you can have tea or water or maybe even a banana. I've heard that before, (laughs) but in church of God, nothing. So children are fasting too. Um, So anyway, this is after the first service on unleavened bread, everybody's struggling and I'm sitting in the back of the pews. Um, We're watching passion of the Christ, of course, which is in a very emotionally charged movie and very graphic in with my person, you're watching yes. it with the children. Yes, my personal opinion: I would not want my child watching that. It's way too much. It's literally murder. Like it's a, someone being murdered for hours. <laughs> you're literally watching that. So, anyway, that's my opinion. But the kids were there, the big kids, and um, there was one little brother next to me, and then another one after him. And he reached over to me, and he was like, "Sister Corey." I don't feel good. And I was like, I know. I was like, it's so, we're really close. Like right after second service, we'll get some water and food and you can take a nap. We'll, we'll hang out in the kid's room until your dad's ready to go. And he was like, okay. And then I'm sitting there too. I'm like, I know, man, me too. <laughs> and um, maybe like a couple seconds later, I look over and he's convulsing in the pew, like shaking, foaming at the mouth rigid falling down onto the floor into the pews in I'm not a doctor but it looked like a seizure in my point of view because he's convulsing and so I started panicking like I started freaking out and I'm like I shouted in the middle of the sanctuary I'm like somebody help me somebody like help 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 he's he's so he's having a seizure you know um everybody stood up everybody freaked out and one of the brothers 
pushed through all the pews, grabbed him. I kicked off my heels and I took off running to John Cuss's office. I'm banging on the door <clears throat> and I'm like, missionary, he was a missionary at the time. I'm like, missionary, there's something wrong with with the brother. And um, he's he's like, what? And I'm like, he's having a seizure. Like, you have to call him like right now. I'm like, I'm panicking. Did you wake him up? It, probably, because he came to the door really slow. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he looked pissed that I had come to the door so frantic. So frantic. Yeah, while well, everyone's watching Passion, he's taking a nap. That's right. That would be my guess. That would be yeah, my guess. That's my personal opinion also, but okay. I digress. <laughs> okay, go on. Yeah, so we run up to the sanctuary lobby and they had brought the little boy out on the on the um couch out there and they had already given him some water and he was laying there kind of coming around a little bit and he's like what's the problem and i'm like he had a seizure missionary like he fell out and was like foaming at the mouth and and convulsing and he immediately turned to me and started screaming at me He's like, are you a doctor? Can you diagnose everybody? Are you Dr. Corey McClellan? Are you able to diagnose everybody? Like, just started ripping into me. Like I'm, I all of a sudden was this target of, <laughs> of this situation. And he started rebuking me like, you, you think that this is okay? You acting like that, causing a scene. You have to remain calm as a leader. You can't be doing this, blah, blah, blah. If you act like that and cause panic and hysteria, how will the other members' faith be, blah, blah, blah. He's not having a seizure. He's fine. He's just tired, blah, blah. Look, he's fine. He's not, you know, like all this other stuff. And I just, I was like, I couldn't process what was happening. Like, I know what I saw and so did everybody else. But I'm getting in trouble for like alerting people. And by the way, this kid did not have a biological parent in the church ever. Like this child never had a biological parent in the church. Even his dad was not really his biological father. And his mom was never a member. So I was just, and I don't, I'm also thinking like liability. Like what if something happens? The church is going to, you know, like I'm thinking of other things too, of course, not just the little boy, but... And I'm just looking at him like, is this happening? Like, I couldn't comprehend that I was getting in trouble for this situation. Trying and that to help a child in need. So. Yeah. Like, why not? Why are you yelling at me instead of calling an ambulance? <laughs> like, or telling the father to take the son to an urgent care or something? Why are you? Why am I getting attacked? Like, I couldn't. I couldn't process it. I. But I was used to getting yelled at by him because he would. He's known for screaming for. Yeah. Really. No, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not easy person. No. So, yeah, no, I could definitely see why um, you would have hesitated to try to say anything to the the woman who the deaconess who had mm -hmm. her um, who was abusing some of the kids because mm -hmm. what happens if you would have spoke out? Mm -hmm. You witness a, a seizure and then you get gaslit and screamed at for it. So, yeah. what else would happen? It's it's definitely, I don't think anyone could really judge you on that situation. I don't think you have to. I hope not. <laughs> really. I mean, it, it's, you know, you're talking about the baptisms and I was somebody who was baptizing children and I know like how uncomfortable the child baptisms can be and how mm -hmm. like, you know, one of the things would be like, you tell the parent, like, don't feed the kid for a while before you bring them. Yeah, so they're certainly. really hungry, so they'll eat the bread and the wine. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the parents will show up and like, I didn't feed my child for hours. Oh. <laughs> and you're like, wow, great faith. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's definitely, um, I definitely understand that, you know, weird things had occurred uh, mm -hmm. over there. But um, let's, let's, uh, let's progress into, you know, the next chapter. Um, sure. Now you've moved into uh, New Windsor. And you have a whole new cast of characters that you're going to be working with. And, you know, I think from what I knew about you, because I've, I've seen you, you've seen me mm -hmm. uh, before. You know, it's a small world. We never actually, like, really interacted much before. Mm -hmm. But I saw you with a bunch of different missions. You were singing. You were um, you're very involved with the music. And you were very involved with um, an LRE exhibit, which is, like, the last Reformation Mm -hmm. uh, where they created a whole museum at the New Windsor uh, facility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I've seen you 
around. And I also had known that you were part of the We Love You Foundation. So I think that you have a lot of great stuff to share on um, your next chapter in New Windsor. Uh, tell us about some of the the stories that you had experienced, some of the, the things that you had gone through. I know that um, Ellery is one. I know that the um, being a member of different parts of New Windsor but what, what are some of the things that really like stand out to you about your experience there? So um, pretty quickly on, I was um, recruited into bigger moving parts of the church. Um, I had gotten involved pretty quickly. I started taking over the uh, mission for the female lodging committee. So another thing in the church is that members are divided into committees to take care of the church um, because the church doesn't actually employ outside services for those who don't know that <clears throat> like yard work done by the members for free cleaning done by the members for free it's like basically free labor it's great for the church <laughs> but they tell us that we're getting paid in blessings you know spiritual blessings in heaven that we can cash in on after we get there um but it but really it's just free labor so anyway i was taking care of the lodging committee and was really putting my heart and soul into it and they noticed and um shortly after that i started actually doing working on they kind of got me to they saw that i was creative and was really into the music. I was always one of the ones who was performing. Um, I was always on a stage and put out to sing in front of people. That was another thing that was really challenging for me to eventually leave because I knew that so many people knew my face and knew who I was. And um, I just knew a lot of members. Uh, so that was really challenging for me because I didn't really want to be in the forefront, but I oftentimes found myself there. Um, anyway, so they recruited me in to start working on this other event that was called then now forever i don't know if you remember that one <clears throat> but it was uh, it was with we love you foundation yeah and i remember it was at the nj peck yep nj peck and yeah i i went with um i i was living in pittsburgh at the time but i had two new york city uh friends that i worked with like co co-workers oh, okay and, you know and i brought them and then they both like just disappeared at intermission <laughs> they, they just ditched me I, I i i drove an extra day to be able to pick them up and at intermission they're like they didn't even say anything they just like gave the irish goodbye and <laughs> wow that's funny go, go on i'm sorry well, it's okay. I know, it's I know okay. you work hard on it but go no, on it's, uh, no no it's okay really <laughs> good for them they just left they were like this is weird so um weird. anyway mm, it was weird but anyway, it, it was weird because I it initially it started as a church event like it was supposed it had a whole different storyline. It was about, um, you know, we wanted to do something about preaching and mother's love and this and that and, you know, whatever. Um, then it slowly evolved into being, oh, let's do it for We Love You Foundation instead. Let's use it as this way to like kickstart the We Love You Foundation here in the U.S. And um, even though I'm this creative person and I can have this ability to like create and write and stuff it's very much dictated by daniel lee like everything has to be like it was his idea like his thing is like okay i want to do this this and this you make it you do it type of thing mm -hmm. um not very often would i have like an original idea that was accepted it would be more like or i would try but it would get shut down you know you a lot of times you bring up your ideas and it's like, no, that's stupid or something. <laughs> you can't rebuke for it being dumb or whatever. And then he'll be like, no, I want it this way. And you can't really uh, be like, that's a little weird. But anyway, we'll go with it. So he just had like this basic idea. And then I had to fill in the pieces. And um, they ended up wanting to make the Mother's Love Art Gallery that was in Manhattan kind of turn into a play. Mm -hmm. So I started working on this play and it became like this two hour long show with dancing and singing and every kind of part of every media for, you know, like that you can imagine, like singing, dance, acting, choir, live orchestra, video, like all that stuff was uh, graphic arts. Like everything was included in this. Um, and it became like the show that we put on and we worked really, really hard on it, but it was very stressful because I became the point person. <clears throat> so I was the one that would have to go in and get all the approvals. And when I mean approvals, working with Daniel Lee is literally like you have to get approvals for like 
What kind of font are we using? What color are we using? What does the set look like? What does the what kind of fabric are we using for the for the dancers? What is the actual costume going to look like? You have to get the approval of every little detail. It's not you're not free to like you can't just create something. It has to be so I'd literally be having these meetings with the creative team and be like, okay, this is what we want to present to pastor. And then you come with a list and like, pastor, we need your approval for this and this and this. And he would go through it and pick apart whatever you're doing, um, which is not a pleasant experience. I don't really know how to explain it. <laughs> no, you go I think that sometimes he's going to disagree just to disagree, just to like show his authority. Yes. Oh yeah, definitely. And a lot of times he'll like, he'll like say something and be like, no, we're going to do it like this. And you're like, all right. So then you go do it. And then you come back and he's like, who did this? This is crap. You know, like, this is terrible. And then you're like, uh, you told us to do it. No, I didn't. Like, it just, and you're like, okay, no, no you didn't. I, I, and he, he, his, his, his uh, agenda, but he, he's just yeah. everywhere. So I'm sure even getting that time with him was challenging. Yeah. Like, get a yeah. chase him. Yeah, you got to chase him. And half the time he's like dismissing you in his off. Like he doesn't even really want to listen to you at that moment. Or like, and you're like, Pastor, is it is it okay if we use this kind of material for the, yeah, that's fine. Just, you know, like just barking at you basically. It's, it's never a comfortable experience to go in his office. I was always afraid. I was always scared to like. It, it was always, you never knew how he's going to react because it could be the same thing. Mm -hmm. But one time he would react very positively and another time mm -hmm. very negatively. It kept you mm -hmm. on guard because you never knew when you were going to get corrected. Yeah. Like, you never knew if he was going to applaud you or like yell at you. <laughs> yeah. It's very like uh, it keeps you off balance. And that's yes. actually one of the things that cults do is because you're oh. always trying to figure out whether or not like you're in a good place or a bad place. You never really know why you're being criticized or what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like, um, there, there was a, a recently like a, a clip of the documentary where they talked about that very thing about keeping you off balance. So you never feel secure and you're always trying to work to be perfect. So that's sometimes it's intentional that, you know, they're random reactions to things. So you're working on this play and you're mm -hmm. having a hard time and you're being micromanaged and. Yeah, it, uh, it, it, then during the time I had, um, he had, he brought me into his office and offered me a job, which I was shocked about because I did not know that, I mean, I heard rumors of people kind of working for the church and this and that, but I wasn't really fully exposed to that world until this moment. And he brought me in the office. I think Rebecca Parker was there and Mary Ellis Ferreira. Um, I don't know if, I can't remember, I can't recall if anyone else was there, but those two were definitely there. Um, they're both missionaries, female missionaries that I'm mentioning. Mm -hmm. And he offered me a job uh, at for the International We Love You Foundation, which was a big shock to me because, to my knowledge, nobody else had ever worked for the foundation. I didn't know it was, like, a legitimate thing. Even me, I didn't really fully understand what it was because as members, excuse me, as members, we are... Um, like one day, you know, you're, you can attest to this. You'll be sitting in service. And then afterwards, the announcement's going to be like, next Sunday, we're going to have a, we love you clean up. Everybody wear your, we love you shirts. And we're like, okay, yay. You know, you, yeah. I have no idea what that means. Like, okay, we love you. Let's go do a cleanup and put a different shirt on. Yeah. And <laughs> that's literally how it would go. So I didn't even know it was like, I didn't really fully understand what it was. Um, I quickly found out because then I was put in, to this position of working for the foundation. And then I also quickly found out that there was no real job description for me um, other than make it work. And what, what, what qualifies as it working? Uh, make it make money. That's, that's what I quickly found out was the end all goal. So make profit from a nonprofit. Yes. Yes. hundred okay. percent. Um, <laughs> so it was basically like make it successful and to Daniel Lee successful means millions of dollars. Um, I recall even being in multiple. So everybody who sits on the board for the We Love You Foundation are all pastors and overseers. They're pastors now, but they're overseers. They're church leaders 
they change it a little bit up in there, like who's actually on the paperwork and stuff, but they're all church leaders. Mm -hmm. So all these board meet board leader meetings or whatever, um, would be me in pastor's office with all the overseers, just basically ripping everything to shreds. Like what's going on? You know, like this is, there's no money coming in at the, in the early days. It was probably the, it was the worst for me because they already had this. Um, so basically what it meant was I became part of the tech team in a weird sense, even though I wasn't on the video team, I wasn't doing photography. I wasn't involved in the websites, but I was all of a sudden in the multimedia team. It was called tech team back then. Um, and there were all already members there who had been working on these missions for years that I didn't know about. And here I am, this young sister with no title <laughs> coming in from Maryland, like out of left field. And I'm put in this crazy position. Like it's seen as like this great blessing. Like all of a sudden I'm just this random it, to them. Like I'm just this, this and why is yeah. she coming here and stealing this thing I wanted to do? Right, yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah. they be like that. Yeah, and they hated me. Hated me. There was three of them specifically that I know actively worked to like try to get me taken down. I just it was the most toxic. I felt like I was in the medieval times, like <laughs> like constantly being thrown under the bus and told on i was being accused of things that were that had nothing that i had no idea were happening things were being kept from me intentionally like they wouldn't let me have passwords to emails or look at things they'd keep me out of meetings intentionally so that i wasn't there they'd go talk to pastor on their own without me there like they were specifically targeting me because they did not want me a part of it and i knew it and I knew that they knew that I knew it. And I knew that the church knew that it was going on, but you have to be, you know, you have to be smiley and happy and you're working together and you have to keep the harmony and the peace. And I couldn't stick up for myself because I knew I was going to get kicked out of the mission. I didn't want to loot. So I was like juggling these crazy personalities of these people who were obsessed with controlling every, like everybody wanted to control it. Daniel Lee wanted to control it. The overseers wanted to control it. These members that were actually doing the work wanted to control it. And here I am put in, in there. And then I become the one that everything is the my fault because I'm the one getting paid. Mm. So because I'm getting paid and I'm on the books, it's my fault. <laughs> no matter what is happening and no matter the other dynamic between who's actually working. Um, that was honestly miserable for me because I knew that they hated me. I, and it was just, I would cry Every day I was crying. I started getting sick. Um, I started gaining a lot of weight. I I was miserable working there. Like it was horrible. I didn't, and to the point where I eventually kind of had a meltdown in pastor's office one day in front of the two deaconesses and the deacon that were actively like giving me this horrible time. And I was, and I shouted. <laughs> I was like, do you guys hate me? Do you want me to leave? Do you want me out? Because I'll go. I'll just go back to Maryland. Is that what y'all want? Is that, you know, like, is this going to make you happy if I leave? Like, I was so upset. And um, from that moment, Daniel Lee made them back off because I think he saw that I was actually really seriously, hurt, like, not okay with this situation. I'm not really sure. Um, he didn't stick up for me in any kind of, any kind of sense. He just made them back off. So... Mm. Ever since then, they kind of left me alone and um, <clears throat> let me just try to do my mission, which wasn't, it didn't matter whether they hated me or not. I was never going to succeed at that because it, he gives you these like asinine type of goals that just don't make sense. And eventually another deacon joined me. He started working with me. This was one of the deacons that actually hated me in the beginning. He wow. ended up. I know. Yeah. Yes. I I love him dearly still to this day. I will keep his identity. <laughs> the members will know. But um, anyway, he started working for, with me and then he started realizing what I was going through. And he was like, oh, my God, I had no idea it was like this. This is awful. <laughs> this is toxic. Like this is 
what is happening? And I'm like, I tried to tell people, like, I'm trying to tell you guys that there's something wrong, that the treatment is just like, there's, I'm so confused. Like one minute I'm told to do this and then I go do it. And then I come back and then I get yelled at for doing it. And then I'm like, but that's what you wanted to do. It's like this round circle of chaos and and I'm also like worried that they're not filing things properly because they're not functioning as a real nonprofit and my name's on it. And I'm just, there's all these things that I was so stressed out about that I was literally losing hair. <laughs> wow. I was <laughs> that, that That's so crazy what you just brought up because a lot of times they do keep their hands really clean. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I've heard the stories about when they want a member to receive like, you know, to have an abortion or something like this, they won't say it. They'll tell somebody else to say it. Yes. I in actually the same way, now, now they're doing shady things with a nonprofit organization, but whose name is on it and who <laughs> you're just following instructions. But, you know, here you are with your name on the way that they're trying to operate a nonprofit yeah. as something beside a nonprofit. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, based on what I'm understanding of this, but that's, uh, that's really, you know, I think it was very deliberate that they had your name and they chose, you know, somebody from the U S to do it opposed to Agreed. having Daniel Lee have his name on it, who is known as a president, mm -hmm. you know, he's giving speeches as a president, but you know, it's your name doing all the stuff, but you're just following directions. Yeah. So I thought that was, I think that's kind of, indicative of what yes. they were planning on. And they, um, I remember once, well, once the um, deacon was, uh, once he joined me, um, we started getting this. So half of my battle was always trying to educate the board on what a nonprofit was and how it should function. Like I had so many PowerPoints that I'd put together and be like, look, we can bring in money, but you can't keep it you have to use it for the nonprofit and you have to use it for what you say you're going to use it for. That's the way a nonprofit works or people do not give you money. And I'd be like, and they, and Daniel Lee would be like, you have to go to all these corporations and get money, get money, get money. We, I remember I was literally given a goal to make a million dollars one year. <laughs> like, like Wilmer was told to make like $3 million or something. And I was told to make $1 million. And we both came out of there and we were like, what the hell? Like we literally were like, what like who's gonna first of all who on the planet is gonna just be like sure let me give you guys a million dollars and because we would constantly go in there and be like okay we can go approach money approach um uh businesses and corporations as a sponsor but they have to sponsor something there has to be a program there has to be something that they can sponsor they're not just going to be like yes mr daniel do with that as you will yeah, here's a here's a check for a million dollars. Amen. You know, like it does not work that way. And half of my battle would be trying to teach these grown men how a nonprofit works. And you know, I'm just a sister. They never gave me a title, and I think they did that now on purpose. When I look back, because I was always a little bit feisty and like I wasn't really like a con like super obedient and controlled. Um, and they could get away with kind of talking to me however they wanted to because I had no title. Uh, I felt like a doormat most of the time because also, as you can probably know, my personality, I'm bubbly and I'm laughing and I'm smiling, but that doesn't really reflect necessarily what I'm feeling, <clears throat> you know? So they felt like, oh, she's just, she's fine. She's just going to laugh and crack a joke, but I'd actually go home like sobbing and my hair's falling out like type of thing. Um, but anyway, that's, I digress. So we're given these, these crazy goals of these crazy amounts of money. And we're trying to tell them how to, how to run a nonprofit. I'm constantly being compared to Mary Ellis because they'll probably come after me for this, but I don't care. <clears throat> Mary Ellis runs big shine for Daniel Lee. I don't know if we can put this in here. I'm going with it. So if you want to, I don't know, <laughs> but it big just, shine. Yeah, Big Shine is the company that Daniel Lee runs. It's his main company. Um, it's only employed by members. Uh, it's like a lighting company. And all the money that's made at Big Shine 
is for the church. The members are paid next to nothing, just like me. Um, like at the We Love You Foundation, you don't get paid hardly anything. And um, they work crazy hours, just like I did. I can't speak on too much of it because I never worked for Big Shine, but I can confirm it exists. I know people who work there. I know Mary Ellis runs it because I was always compared to her. <laughs> like, Mary Ellis made Big Shine like this. Why can't you do it like that with We Love You? And I'd be like, Pastor, like, it's too different. Like, that's a business. This is a nonprofit. Like, it doesn't function the same way. I, I can't sell something. The only thing I can really sell, if you're going to think about nonprofit world, is the program. But we don't have programs. All we have is an idea. There are no real programs, you know, like an actual real. Now, they started trying a little bit. I've noticed. I've seen the website. You know, they have these, like, tools for school, packs on backs, something, whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, like, they actually have some kind of little program now, which they can get sponsorship for those things and it's starting they're starting to function a little bit more like a nonprofit these days that i notice um hopefully somebody saw my freaking powerpoints and like took some notes maybe that's why they did it. but um i was constantly but the early days were awful because i was constantly being torn apart by not doing enough and not being enough and i was getting sick like i had gotten honestly like very sick very ill i was always at one once it got really bad <clears throat> i had gained a lot of weight and um i was getting fevers and rashes on my hands and my feet and my tongue and my throat like blisters and um but my you had a really good insurance policy with the we love you foundation right <laughs> what's that <laughs> i'm sure you have a great insurance? benefits package <laughs> Oh yeah, great benefits package. <laughs> How was your bonus? <laughs> I, I, there were no bonuses, and I had no health insurance. It was not offered to me, and I got paid like nothing. Like I think it was like sixteen dollars an hour or something. And I was doing the work of like but you. You weren't working just forty hours. No, no, no. I was working like I'd be like eight nine in the morning until like twelve one in the morning every day, seven days a week. Like it. It wasn't. A but what about all that overtime if you were being paid by the hour? No, no overtime. <laughs> uh, doesn't sound up the code. Nope, does not. It is not. Um, so, yeah, that was that was kind of what my life was like. And I was starting to get very sick. And I, I wasn't I was never like somebody to like be fake about anything that I was feeling. So I would tell my group leader, who was Rebecca, which is like. I guess in uh, non WMS terms, that would be basically Daniel Lee's executive assistant, kind of. <clears throat> so she's like his right hand was always there doing everything. Um, she's the admin missionary, but she was also my group leader. So I would tell her and I'd be like, look, I'm, I'm like really sick. I'd try to disclose to her like all these things that I was going through and feeling. And um, so she knew all these things, but she just was like, oh, you know, just pray, blah, blah. you know, the same, <laughs> same yeah. type. Of write a letter to mother. <laughs> yeah, write a letter let to mother. Lee read it. Yeah, let Daniel read your, read your letter. And at one point, Daniel Lee even spoke to me. He's like, I feel like you're dying. Like something's wrong with you spiritually. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm just sick, Pastor. I don't I'm know. Losing my hair. I'm gaining weight because of the stress. Yeah, I was so stressed out that I was honestly like deteriorating. Like I just. Yeah, you might have physically been dying. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I really, I was very sick. I, at one point, I had a fever for like 20 days straight. Like it just would not go below 100, maybe 99 every once in a while. <clears throat> and I have pictures like these horrible rashes on my hands and my feet and thinking that there was something terribly wrong with me and I didn't have money to go to the doctor. I couldn't you know, I was starting to go in debt because I was like, I have to figure out what's wrong with me. So I started getting some tests done, but I'd have to put them on a credit card because I don't have the money for it. And I, MRI, I had to get an MRI. I had to, and that's really expensive for people who don't have health insurance. And um, it was it was horrible. And I was very sick. Now I know that I, I was diagnosed with uh, fibromyalgia. They thought I had lupus for a little while. So I had like an underlying issue that was coming out because of this stress. And um, it it was a horrible time. And then I started getting, 
I guess I'll bring this up. <clears throat> then I started getting um, ostracized and bullied because of what I looked like, because of my weight, um, which was a, which was actually my first breaking point in my time in the church after this particular situation that I'm starting to talk about right now was like the first time where I finally was like, something is really wrong. After all the stuff that I'd been through, after everything that I had given up and done and then I started getting like openly publicly shamed because of my weight gain which was very very difficult for me to handle and to deal with especially I don't know if it's different for males but for a female for a male pastor to be publicly making fun of you it's just not a good feeling 